Hello, everyone, and welcome to Research Out Loud, Met Fellows Present. My name is Elizabeth Perkins. I'm an educator at the Met, and I'm very happy to be the moderator for this exciting series of presentations featuring the Met's fellows. In September of last year, the Met welcomed 47 fellows from 20 countries to take part in the 2022 to 2023 fellowship program. Fellows from across many disciplines are provided the time, space, and support to work on dissertations, articles, book manuscripts, undertake conservation training, scientific investigations, and more. Research Out Loud is now an opportunity for fellows to share their work and open up dialogues with the wider museum and the public. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Jonathan W. Hardy. Jonathan is the Jane and Morgan Whitney Fellow in the Department of Ancient Near Eastern Art. He is also a PhD candidate in the Department of Art History at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, where he's finishing his dissertation on the construction of Christian and Zoroastrian identity in Sasanian Iran. His research at the Met Center is around the creation of metrically accurate 3D models of Sasanian seals and ceilings for the purpose of increasing public and scholarly access to the Met's collections. Hello, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to present my ongoing research at the Met. And uh, thank you to the Education Department for organizing the Research Out Loud series. Thank you to the Department of Ancient Near Eastern Art for graciously hosting me for the past half a year. Uh, and a special thank you to my supervisor and chair of this panel, Michael Seymour. Uh, without your guidance and help, none of this would be possible. I've recently been informed that not everyone knows what a seal, bula, and ceiling are, a failing of our education system, no doubt. So let me introduce you to these fantastic little objects. While I speak, you can watch this excellent recreation of using a seal on a bula. For the purpose of our discussion today, seals are semi-precious gemstones, uh, like carnelian, chalcedony and agate, which are then planed down and carved, or more aptly cut with a disc and drilled, with an image according to the owner's wants and needs. You can think of seals as the ancient signature, a unique mark that symbolizes your authority of a good, your authorization of a good or document. The bula, also known as the ceiling, terms which have a pedantic difference but are generally used interchangeably, are lumps of clay that are affixed to a document, vessel, or crate with twine or leather, and then stamped with seals. The image left behind by the seal in the clay is known as an impression, what we'll be discussing at length today. The research presented here is guided by a simple question. What can seals and ceilings tell us about quotidian life in late antiquity? These small lumps of clay, abraded, often broken, and usually discarded, are in a majority of instances all that remains of an ancient person's life and identity. We may not know their name or where they lived and died or what they accomplished in their lifetimes, but these ancient people have gained a sort of immortality purely through the chance discovery of a lump of clay they interacted with briefly in the course of their job. Often eschewed for the fancier silver vessels, rock reliefs, and architectural decoration, seals and their associated ceilings have largely sat on the periphery of art history, acting as mere background oh and also's to the study of Sasanian art. I hope that my humble, humble contribution here will help show the importance of these little objects to our understanding of the late antique world, not as accessories to grandiose claims, but as valuable sources of information in their own right. In the following 20 minutes, I will shed light on just one aspect of these fantastic little objects, looking to an excavated archive of clay ceilings from a late Sasanian city in southwestern Iran. This brief case study combines exploratory network analysis with traditional art historical methodologies to reconstruct the social networks of bureaucrats and middle managers in late antiquity. Just like modern governments today, the Sasanian imperial apparatus was run by a menagerie of unnamed administrators working diligently behind the scenes to keep the gears of bureaucracy turning smoothly. I will first offer some background on the history and excavation of the late Sasanian city of Qasr Abu Nasr, discussing some of the trials and tribulations faced by the excavators and modern scholars attempting to untangle the site. Following this brief foray, 
I will then introduce the corpus of clay ceilings from Kasu Abu Nasser, with particular attention paid to a subset of this corpus, the administrative archive. We then dive even deeper into this administrative archive, where I will reconstruct the social network of bureaucratic operations, essentially the late, the late antique LinkedIn. I will show how this exploratory network analysis transforms our understanding of social and occupational dependencies in the Sasanian era. The Metropolitan Museum of Art, under the guidance of Walter Hauser, Joseph Upton, and Charles Wilkinson, opened their first trench in 1932 on a long, saddle-shaped spur a few kilometers south of modern-day Shiraz in Iran. As the third major site to contain Achaemenid ruins on plein air, the excavators and their financial backers hoped for their own Persepolis, rich in Achaemenid and Sasanian artifacts. Unfortunately for the excavators, their hopes were soon dashed when they discovered the brunt of visible Achaemenid architectural features were merely spolia from Persepolis, moved there by some Islamic governor in the distant past. Nevertheless, they persisted, uncovering the remains of a massive fortress in town, the pre-Islamic Shiraz, resplendent with the remains of a once bustling urban settlement. Amidst this complex and tangled landscape of intersecting walls, streets, rooms, and basins, nearly 500 clay bulai were uncovered in at least two separate locations. Still in the early days of a scientific archaeology, their precise locations were never recorded, save for the general locations of two archives, one Ismail's burnt room and another Ali Askar's burnt room, named after the workers who discovered them. Sadly, the excavators made no mention of which ceilings were found in each room, and the excavation numbers assigned to each ceiling have absolutely no correlation, leaving us with an entirely opaque picture of their original context. Complicating our understanding of the archaeological horizons, the excavators were soon distracted with the promise of early Islamic riches laying underground some 900 kilometers north at Nishapur. With their focus shifting away from the disappointing material of Qasri Abu Nasser, any hope of pub publishing the excavation reports disappeared in favor of the riches of Nishapur. All was not lost, however. Forty years after the initial publication of three brief excavation reports authored by Hauser and Wilkinson, Richard Fry and Prudence Harper introduced the world to the trove of Bulai from Qasri Abu Nasser which had previously escaped practically all scholarly notice. This was then followed by Donald Whitcomb's momentous volume that remains the only synthesized excavation report. Philippe Genou, one of the world's leading experts on Sasanian sigillography, offered an update to Fry's translations of the inscriptions on the Bulai with an article on the Tehran ceilings in 1975, and then a further article on the Metropolitan ceilings in 1985. Exemplifying the dearth of secondary literature, Yanuz single-handedly doubled the number of scholarly publications on the site. It is in this morass of few and far between publications that we begin our journey into the depths of the Sasanian administrative bureaucracy. Using Fry and Harper's volume as a guide, I started to digitize their observations, recording excavation numbers, what seal impressions appear on which ceilings, what impressions appear together, amongst a whole host of other data. As I went through the available data, I began to notice significant gaps and assumptions that necessitated a more rigorous approach to the material. Thus began an extensive search of the archival evidence, including close examination of all 196 ceilings at the Met, measuring and identifying each impression, recording the color and the back style of every single ceiling, and, and diving into photographs taken by the excavators for those ceilings that currently reside in Tehran. This search led me to a modification of the question I posed at the start of this presentation. What can administrative seals tell us about daily life in late antiquity? Administrative seals, outlined in red here, are characterized by their lack of iconography, issuing the image for text that contains no personally identifying information, only the job title and the location of that job. In almost all of the documented cases from Qasri Abu Nasser, the administrative ceiling appears alongside what I have coined a level two or secondary ceiling, circled in yellow. 
These secondary ceilings are usually two to 10 millimeters smaller in diameter than the administrative seals and almost always contain an iconographic element, the ram and the zebu bull being the most common with an inscription also that contains the owner's personal name and the term Magus being the title of a Zoroastrian priest. Shown here is the seal of the manager of the office of the Magi of Shiraz, quite a lofty title, appearing on a total of 27 different ceilings at Khasri Obanasar, only six of which don't contain any level two ceilings. The profusion of these aniconic impressions, comprising 14% of the excavated ceilings, suggested that something interesting might reveal itself if I dug deeper. So if these so-called administrative seals are so common, what exactly do they represent? And what are the administrative positions available for an up-and-coming bureaucrat? Riga Gieselin, another fantastic sigillographic scholar, has identified 12 provincial administrative positions in the Sasanian glyptic, ranging from the highest ranked priest to judges and lowly tax collectors. These positions also appear in the Madian i Hazar Dadastan, the Book of a Thousand Judgments, an early 7th century Middle Persian text on jurisprudence that recounts hundreds of strange and weird court cases, many of which include the legality and verifiability of seals and sealed documents. According to the Madian i Hazar Daristan, administrative seals belonged partially to the person who held the position and partially to the position itself resulting in cases where, after leaving an administrative position, the person who held that position was still able to use the official seal until a formal, doc a formal document certified their abdication or firing. This is opposed to personal seals, which belong solely to the individual and are most commonly identified with the secondary seals that we discussed previously. Of these 12 documented provincial administrative positions, Five appear at Qasri Abu Nasr, the Sharab or Satrap, the defender of the, and judge of the poor, the chief counselor, the chief tax collector, and the administrator of the office of the Magi. These five administrative positions are split among 16 different seals attested at Qasri Abu Nasr, many of which hold the same job title. Interestingly, only one of the impressions, D-177, is directly related to the site of Qasri Abu Nasr, that is, the pre-Islamic Shiraz. And it is, unsurprisingly, the most common administrator seal found at the site, appearing on, as I said, 27 different ceilings. The remainder of the attested impressions come either from administrators higher up the bureaucratic ladder, shown in blue, who also had oversight over Qasri Abu Nasr as part of their bureaucratic duties, or similarly ranked offices in green from external cities like Bishapur, Gur, and Stacher. We should, of course, expect to see some impressions from the higher ranking administrators at Qasri Abu Nasr, as they undoubtedly had to visit the city or send documents there. But the appearance of similarly ranked off officials is rather odd. Why are they represented in the archive? Did they too send things to Qasri Abu Nasr, or did they seal something while they were perhaps visiting the city? To answer the second question, the Madiani Hazar Dadastan indicates that it was possible for a visiting administrator to use their official seal in a different city, at least on legal documents, even if they held no relevant authority over that specific city. If this is the case, then we should expect to see a correlation between local and foreign, i.e. non-local seals, on the ceilings at Qasri Abu Nasr. How then do we test this? Since asking them is understandably out of the question, we need to find another way to determine who they worked with. One such way, and the one that we will use here, is mapping the network of correlations in the archive. So, Following the transitive property of equality, if you remember all your ways back to algebra, if foreign administrative seal A, like the Bishapur or Stacher impressions, appears on a clay ceiling X with a different seal B, and that seal B also appears on a different clay ceiling Y, with an impression known to originate from Shiraz or Qasri Abu Nasr, like D177, then we can say for certain that the foreign administrative seal A was either A or one used at Qasri Abu Nasr, or two, the owner of seal B worked at both locations. If no such connection exists, 
then we can conclude that the foreign administrative seal A was impressed on the clay ceiling elsewhere, and whatever the ceiling was attached to was then shipped to Qasri Abu Nasser. To gather the data necessary to not only test whether or not the foreign administrator ceilings were made at Qasri Abu Nasser, but to also understand the archive as a whole, I first identified every bulai that an administrator seal appears on. I, I recorded its excavation number, accession number if at the Metropolitan Museum, and the physical characteristics of the bulai, like color, back style, and size. I then recorded any other impression on the bulai identified in the first stage, paying particular attention to the largest non-administrator impression, the secondary set, the level two that I identified earlier, recording its size, location, and relative angle in relation to the administrator seal. Performing the same process as step one, I identified all the bulai that those second level impressions appear on. This process then repeated until the entire network of impressions was recorded. In total, this encompassed seven iterations recording 121 individual impressions, or roughly one third of the total impressions from the site, and approximately half the total bulai. This then builds up a network that uh, of everyone that worked together at Qasri Abu Nasser. Networks uh, consist of two basic elements, nodes and edges. The nodes, or colored circles, represent each individual seal. Their size represents how important they are to the network as hubs. The larger the circle, the more connections it has, which is why D-177, the office of the Magi of Shiraz, is the largest node since it is connected to most other seal impressions. The labels that you see here are unique identifiers associated with each seal. In light red are the administrative seals that we discussed previously, and in green are the so-called Magu seals, or the secondary or level two seals. The lines, called edges, represent individual clay ceilings. If two nodes are connected by an edge, it means that they appear on the same ceiling. The colors of the nodes and edges represent close-knit communities that coalesce around hubs. Uh, think of the largest node in each community as the airport from which all other nodes of the same color are able to access the rest of the network with the least amount of effort. Given such a dense and well-connected network, these isolated groups uh, containing only one to three impressions immediately stand out. The keen-eyed will see a plethora of administrative seals here, which begs the question, who exactly are these rogue administrators? In contrast to the possibility of non-local sealing practices mentioned in the Mariani Hazar Dadastan, these isolated clusters all contain a non-local administrator seal and one or two other impressions that don't occur anywhere else in the archive. Their isolation from the central network strongly suggests that the clay ceilings they appear on were created somewhere other than Qasri Abu Nasser perhaps their stated city, and whatever they were attached to was then sent to the site. Looking then to the central network, we see, as expected, the primacy of D-177, acting as the central hub that connects the extreme ends of the network together. And unlike the isolated clusters of the previous slide, the five remaining administrative seals are all connected by at least one intermediary node. In green, the Sharab of Vishapur and the Andarsbed of Ardakshihora, the two highest ranking officials in the corpus. These are separated from D-177 by only one intermediary node. More tenuously connected are D-207, D-99, and D-12, all equally ranked officials to D-177. If we were to remove D-40 or D-156, which you can see essentially in the center of the slide, they would essentially break the, uh, the connection of the entire network together. So if we run an algorithm that calculates the betweenness centrality of each node, that is the numerical measure of how many times a node appears on the shortest route between every connected node in the network, we can determine precisely how important D40 and D156 are to the network, as well as reveal any other similarly important nodes. Betweenness centrality is shown here both as a gradient of orange to purple and as the relative size of each node. 
The more purple and the larger the node is, the more important it is as a bridge between communities in the network. Isolating these nodes reveals a set of 18 different impressions through which 90% of all traffic in the network is routed through. Further filtering the remaining nodes to those with the lowest authority ranking, i.e. the nodes with fewer non-important uh, important edges, reveals six impressions that are the most important bridges in the network. It turns out that they are the most innocuous seals in the entire archive. These small, simplistic designs almost never appear in a prominent place on a clay ceiling. Their diminutive stature and placement on the clay ceilings has fooled scholars, including myself, into ignoring them for the more flashy inscriptions and symbols. It is rather fitting that the most important people, the bridges between various communities, are those people who use the most innocuous seals. In a direct attack on scholarship's fascination with the grandiose, it is the most simplistic and schematic iconography of an already schematic medium that bore the burden of linking vastly different administrative apparatus. The irony is not lost on me, as I too fell into the trap of the grandiose, but perhaps my folly will serve as a lesson never to discount the innocuous. Thank you. So as in, um, in the order of our, our speakers, I'll, I'll start with one for, for you, John. Um, uh, Judith Lerner uh, says, thank you, Jonathan, for your innovative and thought-provoking work and impressive presentation. Have you considered that the small, seemingly insignificant seal impressions, typically, and I think in the Kastri Abu Nasser examples without inscriptions, could be those of witnesses? Perhaps their being the most common suggests that they might be those of professional witnesses, in quotes, who were brought in or worked for the authorities at Qasr Abu Nasser, though it's strange that they appear so, uh, quotes, unofficial, um, i.e. anepigraphic and less elaborate in design. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, a kind of a fantastic point. And I, I hope over the next few months to look not only at the remainder of the impressions, the 300 some odd uh, impressions that we still have from Kasri Obanasar that didn't, that weren't connected with this, uh, but also to, to start to see what's happening at, at Takhtay Suleiman, uh, particularly with uh, El Motinsa's uh, and I believe Yusuf Muradi's uh, recent grant that they got that they're going to be looking at all of these uh, ceilings so kind of paying very close attention to to the work that they'll be doing to see if there's you know any sort of correlations there but uh yeah i think there is it's it's a, a really difficult thing to see because uh you know we only have so much evidence that's that's left and i uh, unfortunately they're the the as you say an epigraphic one so we don't really know exactly who they are um one kind of you know additional point to that is that we don't we don't see a great deal of correlation between uh two seals uh two impressions always appearing together uh which is again another very odd and interesting fact uh, i think there's there's a lot going on here uh that definitely you know people smarter than i will will definitely have to 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 look at this uh, but yeah thank you so much for your for your question great thank you and maybe i'll just follow on on quickly by giving you a moment to talk about the corpus because obviously this is a group from Qasri Abu Nasser where the seals are split between um, the Met and the Iran Bastan Museum in Tehran. Um, so, uh, would you would you mind talking just for a second about um, about that about dealing with the the sort of complexity and representativeness of the corpus you're looking at? Yeah, it's a, one of the 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 kind of great things about you know being at the Met is that I have access to 196 of them, and the as I was kind of going through uh, this this research and building up uh, this sort of network, I, I ended up, you know, kind of creating a, a, a database of, we have seals or impressions that are in uh, Tehran, and we have impressions that are in uh, the Metropolitan Museum. And it turns out that the excavators, when they they split, uh, basically everything was split 50-50 between Tehran and the Met Museum at the, during the excavations. And the 
uh, the, the really fascinating thing is, is that there is, we have a representative example of all 500 of the, of the impressions at the Met, and there's a representative example of all 500 in Tehran. So it's basically, they were split almost perfectly uh, evenly so that, you know, if there was two of one type of impression, Tehran got one, the Met got one. Uh, it's a really even split. So it, it kind of makes it much easier on my part because I know kind of for a fact that I have that uh, a representative sample of the entire corpus uh, to work with hands on. And, and that gives me a lot more confidence in the, the results that I'm, I'm drawing here. We have more questions that have come in. I have um, one for, uh, for John, um, anonymous attendee. He says, I, uh, the question is, I noticed that six common, of the six common seals you, um, that you found, I think that you showed in the final slide, um, had what appeared to be a bird symbol. Do you know what kind of bird? Um, maybe a simur or a regular bird? We could only hope for a, a simurg. Uh, it's it, the the oddly enough the, <laughs> the 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 most common uh, representation of any sort of the the seals that we see at Kasri Obanasser is bird related. Uh, it's if I remember correctly, fifteen percent uh, of kind of all of all the total impressions that we have, 50% of them are somehow related to bird uh, or bird type imagery. And at Takti Suleiman, uh, from what Bulai have been published so far, it's 45%, uh, which is kind of just outstanding that, that everyone really loved birds uh, in the Sasanian in the Sasanian era. Um, and this is kind of in contrast to, to what's in museums where it's in the British Museum in the Met uh, for actual seals uh, represents only roughly 10% and even less so for the Louvre and the, the Bibliothèque Nationale at, at 5%. Uh, so birds were whilst in kind of what museums are collecting, uh, they don't appear very often, but what we have on the actual kind of archeologically uh, attested ceilings, uh, birds were incredibly common. So I, I think it would be, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I hope to do kind of in the future uh, is much more uh, dive in depth into, into birds. Uh, but to, I think I know the one, the, the impression that you're speaking of, uh, and I'm pretty sure that it's probably uh, a lot of couching my, my, my answer here, but I'm pretty sure it's probably a pheasant. Uh, so we could hope for a Simurg and maybe one day, maybe one day there'll be a Sasanian Simurg, but you never know. 